TSR. He's written in Star Wars, Magic the Gathering, Dragonlance, StarCraft, and more. Welcome to the show, Jeff Grubb. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, we actually had a uh, friend of yours on not that long ago uh, at, uh, at Greenwood. Oh, yeah. And um, you and he officially, I guess as far as uh, TSR and Wizard Skills, created the Forgotten Realms. Um, why don't we get start on that? Okay. Um, since we know he wrote the Forgotten Realms and created them when he was like seven. His first, he, he probably told you this story. He wrote his first Forgotten Realms story like when he was seven. One comes unheralded to Zerta, which uh, involved, among other things, uh, uh, Elminster magically cross-dressing. Very precocious child. And I think uh, we reprinted it many years ago with a little folder to give away at uh, uh, a Gen Con. Uh, so in, when Dungeons & Dragons came along, he started setting adventures in the realms that he had created. He's the creator of the Forgotten Realms. Uh, where I, and over time, he started submitting articles to uh, Dragon Magazine, you know, Five Swords of the Realms, uh, Seven of Elminster's books, and he would put in a framing device of where Elminster comes to visit Ed and basically steal his beer and say, oh, that reminds me, I should talk about this subject, and he basically does, does the article. And and after about the fourth article, uh, Kim Mohan, the editor, just stopped. He used to cut the intros and just print the stats. Then he left the intros in, and they became popular as well. Um, in the first, and where I come into it, is I had been one of the uh, co-creators of the Dragonlance team. And after Dragonlance came out and was getting very successful, uh, management was actually concerned that Dragonlance might fade, might you know, be a flash in the pan. And so what are we going to do next? And we threw around ideas, and I said, well, Ed has all of these, you know, articles he does. Maybe he has a world behind that. And so that's how I ended up drawing the short straw to call up Ed and saying, so can we, you know, buy, can we buy your world? Uh, and we, uh, we purchased the realms for a very low amount of money, a uh, promise of books, of novels, and uh, a Apple Mac Plus without a hard drive. And we liked Ed so much is the next year we got him a hard drive, so he wasn't going to have to swap discs every you know five minutes. Um, <laughs> that that's, it's true. I, that, that, I, we we I mean, we're talking ultimate sneaker net, getting stuff down from Canada. He's he's a librarian up in uh, Colborne, and uh, he would send these packages uh, of manuscripts and a disc down for you know oh, here's all my stuff I've organized this week and and everything, and he would wrap it in such a way that would defy Canadian customs to open it. So, you know, you'd open it and it'd be uh, a grocery bag paper on the, on the outside. Uh, and then you'd open it and there'd be a heavy layer of plastic, Canadian plastic wrap, which is like windshield uh, material. And you'd unpack that. And then there'd be another bag under that. You'd unpack that. And there'd be foil under that. And you'd unpack that. And there would be the manuscript with a disc that is also wrapped in three layers of various types of packing material. So that whenever I got a pack from uh, Ed, my neighbors in the office would know when we uh, when I got them because I would you know, they would hear me just wrapping unwrapping paper for like five minutes to get to the heart of the manuscript. <laughs> Good uh, Lord. And one of the re one of the reasons we got him a uh, uh, got him got him a Mac and got him computer literate was uh, some of the early stuff he sent was typewritten from his original files that he photocopied, and his typewriter did not have a T key. So he would type a page, and then he would go back and draw in all the T's. So it was like working with a little graveyard, because all these little crosses all over the manuscript. <laughs> oh but Ed and I worked together for about six months on the project, and we finally met at the flesh at Gen Con that year. 
uh, while we were assembling the TSR booth because this TSR of the age, you know, we all go to Gen Con and we go down the day before and we put the booth together, among other things. And he's holding up one end of the booth and I'm holding up the other end of the booth. And uh, I, I said, oh, by the way, my name is Jeff Grubb. He says, oh, pleasure to meet you. I've been working with you for the past six months. Uh, I'm Ed Greenwood. And it just was one of these cute meets. <laughs> I like this. Mm-hmm. We, we, we I, go back. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, though, I, I, as I hear you talk about that, what was going through your mind when you realized and you put the face to the name and then went, you, and your <laughs> Canadian glass packages? <laughs> no, no, no. It, it just, it, working with Ed is a delight. Uh, I wrote a novel with him, um, Cormier. Uh, which we originally were put, we put together as one of these Michener type novels like Oklahoma or Ohio or you know Nebraska, and it was going to be the history of um, Cormier, and he was writing the modern sections which involved a plot to king, kill King Azuna, and I wrote the histories. So I'd worked out the histories and the sections and why Cormier is the way it is. Why is it you know against the law to meddle with the sex of a cat? Uh, why why what are the uh, the kings like there's an, a zoom personality these very uh, uh lusty lively kings that they've had over the years much more alisair than tanis lanta uh tanalasta and uh, she's um and so we wrote our each other's uh, uh the sections and then we swapped and we edited each other so we rewrote each other to try to try stabilize because Ed writes in long, engaged, uh, descriptive, confusing paragraphs, and I write in short, uh, uh, distinct, confusing paragraphs. So between the two of us, we managed to put it together, and the editor sent us back a note that said, this is much better than I had any right to expect, <laughs> because he was apparently <laughs> dreading the idea of the two of us, the worst properties of the two of us coming together on one on one novel. Well, I, I, I like that the whole fact that, you know, at least it, they were both confusing. Yes. And, the common thread. And having, it's our nature. And having read one of your books, the last, I, read, I just finished Scourge. Yes. And the book we read it before that was The Herald. I can definitely see what you're meaning by the differences in writing and paragraphs. Mm -hmm. we, we've got mm -hmm. very, very, very different. In Cormier, there is this beautiful, beautiful sequence that Ed wrote of, I believe it was uh, set in on a second floor restaurant in Arabelle, one of the cities in Cormier, and it was a fly through, and he talked about what was happening at every table, and who was doing this, and who was saying this, and he just threw, had nothing to do with the plot, okay? The plot did not uh, advance one inch during the entire procedure, but it was just so cool we had i had to you know let's leave it in completely intact <laughs> so i'm really curious you you created you helped create dragonlance with um the hickman with tracy yes and uh then greenwood with forgotten realms yes. what's the difference between working with tracy hickman and ed greenwood as far as the creation process of these well now long lasting fantasy worlds yeah, I'm, I'm stunned they've lasted as long as they have um they're two very different projects in that uh, Dragonlance came about at uh, TSR at the time. We were all you know, assigned to you know, come up with ideas, and Tracy had come up with an idea of three modules that were based on dragons. And this is where Dragonlance got its start. Harold Johnson saw that and, and encouraged him to expand it out to, uh, he, Harold was our boss at the time, uh, expand it out to you know, one for every color. I came on about the third, as the third guy in, and we said, and Tracy was already setting up the world. But basically, this was created as a world in place for this particular, so we can do novels, so we can do um, uh, game product. At one point we talked about toys, we made a presentation showing all the different types of things. This was early transmedia type of, of everything we could do with this uh, novel idea. And so it, it was something that was created in place and for a specific uh, set of products. The Realms comes a lot more out of that uh, this is my campaign from 1972 let, uh, 77, let me, let, me, uh, uh, let me see how I can you know, modify it and see it grow up. So as a result we had sections that had long uh, epic write-ups like Rashomon uh, 
uh, or the Golden Fields or, or, of course, Shadowdale, and areas that were nearby that had nothing, like Sembia. Sembia was a place where conniving merchants came from that the players would then, you know, uh, foil the various plots and plans. So we found a way of, you know, of, of creating that larger universe, but we were working with much more of a fixed thing. The other big difference is that, the re- that Dragonlance was built around its epic. It basically is the story, the fight against the Dragon Lords, and that made it a very, uh, I think, wonderful story. But as you got further away from the epic, the less relevant it seemed to Dragonlance. Uh, I always refer to Dragonlance as a tree and the Forgotten Realms as a bush. The bo- Dragonlance, uh, Forgotten Realms, we... Things, using things we had learned from Dragonlance, we had a whole bunch of stuff going on in the early years. We had, you know, Ed was working in the, the area of uh, Shadowdale. I was doing some stuff in Cormier. Uh, Doug Niles, who, by the way, also is a wonderful writer and actually has written more Dragonlance adventures modules than anyone else. I mean, he's just one of the unsung heroes. He was working over in Moonshay. We redrew the Moonshay Isles to accommodate his uh, his his book. And Bob was you know up in the north with uh, Wolfgar and uh, this you know this secondary character he had created a particular dark elf that turned out to the, be the big breakout hit of the realms. I always refer to him as the Fonzie Fonzarelli of the Forgotten Realms. <laughs> it's, it's very true. He came in and he just sort of rolled and struck a chord, and that's actually the sort of thing we really wanted to do with the realms. We wanted to throw a whole bunch of stuff out there and see what really appealed most. And really, this whole this whole process with both of these started because you were overseeing. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, right? A D and D. Right. I was uh, well. I wasn't. I don't think I was a product manager yet, but I quickly became one because I knew where all the bodies were buried. Um, <laughs> dun dun dun. But one of the thing, one of the things was, right? The advan- the A D and D system did not have a world per se. It had Greyhawk, and Greyhawk was uh, was Gary's, and Gary uh, Gary was very concerned about you know who was writing for it, what was being published, what was being done, and how it was being developed. So you didn't get a, a lot of projects got orphaned. Uh, the Tomb of Martek, Desert of Desolation series, uh, a lot of the end series, they didn't really have a home. Per se. One of the things the Realms was created to do was to provide a home for all of these uh, modules and adventures that didn't really belong to anybody at that point and bring them all together into one world. And uh, I guess you're probably a good person to ask for this, since I couldn't even figure this out in Baldur's Gate. <laughs> what the heck is Thacko? Thacko? Thacko, yeah. Thacko is to hit armor class zero. Because I... I it's the weirdest stat I've ever seen. I know. It, 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 that's, it's that, that's, what, that's what it is. Um, it's a class zero. Originally, okay. okay, original AD&D first edition, we had tables that you basically had to look at and cross-reference. My, uh, my warrior is level five. This is an armor class seven creature. That means I need this to, uh, to hit. And early on, uh, TSR did not come up with Thaco per, uh, per se. Um, it came out of our tournament operation, RPGA and the D&D Open, because someone did the calculations and said, you know, you don't need the table. You just need to know what the armor class, you to hit armor class zero is, and then calculate it accordingly. And that was, and then you could, you know, basically figure against the armor class you were half, and that would give you your number. So as opposed to a table, it became a formula, and that became Thaco counting down. And you know, lower armor classes are are good. Two is better than seven. Um, this is very old school stuff. That eventually was it with third edition, fourth edition. We swapped them. We I think it's third edition, and now better armor classes made more sense. But Thaco was just this was a part of the discussions as you as a game evolves and develops, and people throw in. I have no idea who the person was that said, you know, it's a formula. All you have to do is this. But that is one of those revolutions that happened in the early days of D and D. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So you worked with TSR. You helped with the Forgotten Realms. You helped with Dragonlance, and then TSR was bought by Wizards of the Coast, which is now, well, now the gaming company. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was actually not there during the purchase. 
Oh, I was not a member of TSR. I had left earlier. Um, I worked on Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, uh, Marvel Superheroes, uh, an early role playing game with Steve, uh, uh, superhero role playing game with uh, Steve Winter that has a lot of fans out there still. Um, Al Qadim. DC Comics a bit too, didn't you? We did. I wrote some DC Comics. In fact, my artist, I did uh, uh, four issues of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons comic book for as an audition, and then they needed somebody to pick up the Forgotten Realms comic book. And the original writer for the first four issues I'm sorry, the first four issues of the AD&D book, he did his four issues and he left, so uh, they needed some people to write, write, and I auditioned, and they liked what I did, so they asked me to be the writer on the Forgotten Realms book, which worked out very well for DC, because they were getting my scripts with the assumption they were pre-approved, that I would let my boss read them and they, before I even sent them to DC for to make sure they, wor- they worked out. But what's cool about that is my artist on the Forgotten Realms line, the first artist, uh, and the artist of the bulk of it was a guy named Rags Morales. And Rags is actually become a – this was his first job, but he's since become a big-time uh, comic book artist. He was with uh, – um, I want to say Grant, Grant Morrissey, but that's wrong. Um, Grant Morrison on um, – uh, this new Superman relaunch. When they relaunched that a couple of years ago, he was the artist on that. And so it's very nice to see Rags. You know, I think he's doing some Avengers stuff now. But I remember him when, when we were, you know, arguing on the phone about how to, how to you know, best portray portray the, uh, the stories. It was a lot of fun. We did some 24, 25 issues. It was very nice. Uh, uh, my management found out about it and... Um, uh, the upper highest levels of our management said, why are if one of our employees writing comic books for somebody else? And they sort of sent word down saying, we're going to uh, – the middle management sent word saying, we're going to come and tell you that you're not going to be allowed to write comic books anymore. So you should basically get as many contracts set up in advance before we tell you so you can finish the, finish the comic book out before we have to tell you that you can't do it anymore. So they were, the the upper manager said no he can't do this the middle management said uh, said said no problem we're gonna get we're gonna warn him in advance so he can so he can solve the problem so they can say don't do this wink 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 hurry up don't don't, don't do this well can I finish up the, the the books that I've been contracted for yes yes you can finish up the books you're contracted for and <laughs> that worked out very nicely so a lot of your work seems to be. Well, it's obviously like role play games um, associated. Your Star Wars book is based off of a Star Wars role playing scenario. That's what we call. I had written ten years previous. That was very strange in the fact that I literally you get the holocron, which is the uh, which was the uh, big data bank of everything that you're supposed to check and be sure is correct within the uh, Star Wars universe. And I kept find and I also used Wikipedia, the online. Uh, you know, kept by fans sort of things. And I kept finding references. Okay, i got to look up this for huts. And I keep, kept finding that I was my own reference. I was my own source <laughs> material. People were going back and taking stuff that I had written pre- 10 years previously about the huts and saying, this is the way huts are. So that made it life a little easy for that. Oh, I wanted, wanted to back up just a sec. Um, I mentioned that I had left uh, TSR before the buyout. Um, I had worked on a lot of different projects, and I was feeling very burned out, and I had the opportunity to leave and work with Margaret Weiss on her Mag Force 7. They do the Sovereign Stone. They've been the Sovereign Stone game. At the time, we were doing collectible card games for her Star of the Guardians novels and Wing Commander, The uh, again, the computer game. And Wing Commander, I know that game. Yes, you know. and we actually... Wing we, Commander! <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, sorry, sorry. Our camel connection there, if I recall, too. We did a, um, and we actually did it, it convinced them that it was a promotion, so it wasn't really a lot. We didn't have to pay a licensing fee. It was a promotion for Wing Commander, so that worked out well. And during that time, I picked up a couple, uh, was doing some freelance novels. Then the purchase occurred, and... TSR, i got to explain, it was based in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which is this small tourist destination just north of the Illinois border. People from Chicago come up during the, during the summer, and, you know, the downtown district is very, very touristy, and then you get back into the areas, and we're just a small town operation. So when 
all of the uh, crazy creatives went west with uh, uh, wizards, it, it did get kind of uh, um, quiet in the area. And so, you know, kept on going. I was invited, I was, my wife and I came out for a wedding of a friend in Seattle where Wasi was based. I dropped in, talked to uh, Bill Slavisek and asked him if he was interested, you know, needed an old time designer. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a job offer and said, yes, will you come work for me? And that was part of how my, my Wizards of the Coast career started. So I wasn't there during the, the worst of it when they were having printing problems, meaning that the uh, printers were insisting on being paid. So, you know, I had, I had dropped out of the sequence by then. So uh, we'll, we'll talk Star Wars, and then we're going to backtrack to more more wizard sure, stuff. Sure, I, 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 we can go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you wrote Scourge, Scourge, which for me is one of the few Star Wars books. It's, it's kind of like a John Jackson Ellis Knight Aaron that kind of stands on its own. It doesn't need anything else around it. Right. It, it really doesn't, um, which is good for you now that they've you know kind of reset the canon because your book still fits anyway because it, it doesn't need anything. It, it just fits on its own as a standalone. It, it, it has some references to, you know, who uh, Manders' Jedi teacher Batman. was and, and who Manders' teacher's teacher was, and we, we basically, you know, backstory that. But yes, we, we uh, it is self-contained. And because so, I love the universe itself, but the universe does not necessarily have to involve all the iconics. Yeah, and uh, that's one. That's one thing I really, I, I really, really liked about the book, because the the book is it feels. I actually, I recognize the scenario that you were playing from Star Wars role playing, um, and and it's the uh, you know it's a greasy underbelly of Star Wars, and it fits so well without needing anything else. And it's really hard for a lot of authors to write books without the main characters, without them either getting silly or them basically creating their own Han Solo, their own right, play their own Luke for this. And so, um, how were you approached to write Scourge, and what was it like returning to your own work to create a book of it so many years later? Um, I'm, I'm telling some tales out of school here, but uh, Scourge was not the original plan. Uh, originally, they contacted me. Someone had recommended me as a writer who could write very quickly in uh, particular uh, in shared worlds, which is where a lot of what I've been writing over the years, whether it's StarCraft or WarCraft or Ghosts of Ascalon for ArenaNet, I'm working in worlds where a lot of other people are bumping shoulders, and I'm very good at coordinating those realities. Um, and I said, yes, I'm, I'm available. And they asked me if I, because they were going to be working on a computer. They wanted a novel for a computer game that would come out that November. And I said, I don't have a problem. I looked around, did some due diligence. It was like July, and there was no sign from anyone that this game was coming. They hadn't announced it, which is unusual for a computer game. And I said, yes, and I worked with them through my agency. But if you cancel the, ga the game, I keep the advance. Okay, if you cancel the book, I keep the advance. And they, they said, okay, well, that, that's fine. we're not going to cancel the book. So, okay. Well, they canceled the game, of course. The, the, mm -hmm. the game fell apart. The, the company that was working on it had never done a Star Wars pro product before, and they crashed and burned. I think somebody else picked it up and, and finally got it out the door. But I had done an outline for them, so I had been paid. And I'm feeling, feeling pretty comfortable with that. And they came back to say, well, you know, we've got this outstanding contract. Would you be interested in writing a, a different book for us? I said, sure. What would you like? And they said, well, we'd like a um, uh, we're, we've got this uh, old Republic MMO. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I really I wish them the best of luck, but I really can't do uh, a compete a pro work in something competing that closely with. Guild Wars, which was, of course, Guild Wars 2 was coming out in the same time frame. And we, uh, so that, type, that would be bad. And they said, okay, we understand. And they went away. And they came back a third time and said, you know, how would you feel about doing an original novel? And I said, okay. And I sent them like six different ideas. And there was some serious stuff in there, and there was some silly stuff in there. I did have a Jax the Giant Green Rabbit story. I had a, <laughs> I had a Dexter Jetster story. I had the autobiography of Jar Jar Binks, and where he dies surrounded by his, by his children, a hero of his people. And this was all potentials. And also I had among them, this is, by the way, I had written 10 years ago, a hut story. Here's, the, here's how the, I would handle the plot. And they said, we like the hut story. Can you do that? And that's how I ended up writing uh, Scourge. And, yes, I was trying to avoid too much of the connection of uh, – I wanted to you know, try to give uh, Eddie a different personality 
than uh, uh, Chewbacca, you know, because he's the non-human uh, co-pilot. So that, that's, you know, that's okay, that's a trope. We've seen it before. How do we do it differently? And originally he wasn't supposed to have any lines. He was supposed to be like, you know, Ferb or Phineas and Ferb, the one who doesn't say anything. But he kept showing up with these perfect lines. So I just had to get rid of it. I could not sustain the idea that he wasn't talking. And instead he's just the guy that you don't notice until it's too late, being a boffin. So that was that was fun. That was really a uh, it was a good book. I really enjoyed it. Did a short story that was a spin-off for it. And to be frank, I wouldn't mind working for him again. Can't and, you call me. <laughs> <laughs> and and your your book actually is the one that depicts huts in the most interesting way I've ever seen. Like I play tour. Yeah. I played Code Tour One and Two. I've um you know those huts used in uh, Kevin Anderson's novel Dark Saber I had a lot of huts. Right. You know, they've, they've shown up in lots of things, but your your book is the one that depicted in ways I never expected Huts to act. Like, I'm used to Huts being slimy. I'm not used to Huts actually, you know, being semi-honorable. I'm used to Huts, you know, I, you, no one's really delved into spice warfare, you know, the slimy underbelly as much as you have. And it's really fascinating and refreshing because, honestly, I'm at the point now where I'm kind of glad that you got rebooted because... I'm, I'm, I, there's only so much you can do with certain characters, and it's starting to repeat itself, or the exactly. characters become godlike. If the Huts, and godlike characters get annoyed. Oh yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> I, I have to agree. If, if huts are only can only be slimy individuals, then you know that that's a limitation to them, and trying to get past that is is part of the goal there. But Papara is a criminal. Papara is a harsh harsh creature. He you know he, he's very unforgiving to his enemies, and we make that quite clear. But he also has incredible loyalty to his uh, children, and we've seen that develop particularly over uh, the animated. Uh, cartoons where they're talking about uh, Big Mom and the uh, uh, what's his name Zeno, um, the Truman Zero the Zero Hut, the, hut. the, the Seven Effeminate Hut, the Truman Capote, <laughs> the Truman Capote Hut. I, I you know I that, that that's okay. I know where you're coming from there, um, but that's the sort of uh, tr- show some variety, show some difference, and there what one of the influences on Scourge was another. Uh, novel and movie of the 70s, The Godfather. And basically, I can you, the connections are there. So, you know, you got Michael, instead of Michael, you have Mika. You know, we didn't go through the same plot, we didn't go through the same pacing, but the whole idea of The Godfather as being, you know, uh, criminal and family man is an interesting dualism to play with, with Papara and his family. It was also really fascinating not to have, say, godlike characters, because a lot of people, they can write Jedi, yep. but most series, the Jedi is like, is like the Force Unleashed. He's a god, basically. He can do whatever you need to do to win the plot in the end. Mm-hmm. And your, your Jedi was not perfect. He had lots of weaknesses, and it was spelled out throughout the story. And I, I like having characters who, who are closer to, like me, that I can relate to better than... Someone who, Some you know, like Luke Skywalker you know. in the later books, is basically he can smash anything he wants to because he is yeah, God no, Skywalker. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I, I have to agree with you, Jeremy. I'm the same way. It's like you, you, you go, wait a second. He has weaknesses and, 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 and downfalls and more, please. I want that. Well, Bander Zuma it has imposter syndrome. He feels, okay, I'm a Jedi, but I don't feel – literally, I've, I've heard the stories too. I've seen what's happened. I know what the great things that the Jedi have done in the past. I'm not doing that. I mustn't be a very good Jedi. And that's sort of where the nascent of the idea of imposter series, that people will eventually, imposter syndrome, which people will eventually catch me. They will eventually find out that I am a fraud, and writers have this a lot. So I'm, we're pulling from personal experience here. Uh, that, and there will be the, you know, the hordes will descend upon you with the pitchforks and the torches and say, no, you aren't truly brilliant. So, Burn him at the stake. Burn him! <laughs> Do it. So, yeah, but that's, uh, that, but that's very much, and it did make um, Mander a much more humanistic and relatable character. And I'm very interested in knowing where he would go next, because the last sequence is he shows him he's starting to come to terms. Okay, what happens now? Where do we go from here with this, you know, archivist uh, Jedi? And I don't know if he's going to be part, if he would, and the way I understand it, 
anything that is uh, of the expanded universe could be picked up and used in the uh, reboot in the new new uh, new universe um, if they so choose. So right now it's just out there hanging, and if they choose to use him or concepts from that. More power to them. If not, okay, we've done a, done a nifty little novel that a lot of a different. It's not a standard novel. It's not your standard uh, Luke novel or Han novel. Um, I said that there's like three types of uh, Star Wars novels. There are Jedi novels. You know, the, the stuff with the, the Dark Jedi and with and Luke's journey and Mara Jade. All those fit into that category. And there are the war novels, which are the uh, squadron novels and based on the war novels, the clone trooper novels. Uh, and the third group, which is my favorite group, are the rogues and scoundrel novels. These are the people who live in the world. They don't have a side. They basically much more, have much more limited goals. And my, well, some of my favorites early on were the... Uh, uh, Tales books, like Tales from Osiris, Tales from Dallas I, I'm going to go back even further. Uh, the Han Solo corporate sector novels. The Brian Daly one? Yeah. Ah, and then there's the Lando. The Lando one's even weirder, though. But La- are- yeah, Lando was... That was just <laughs> Those are strange. <laughs> that was odd. I, 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 yeah, I actually was about to out. say... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was actually about to say that those were just wrong. But, but they weren't no, really no, wrong. No, they were just really weird. We're talking Zorba the Hutt, Glove of Darth Vader, right. Mission of Mount Yoda, those are strange. But the Han Solo ones, yeah. The Brian Daly novels, the really, the ones where they couldn't use any Darth Vader or any of those type of things. Exactly. They went on, and you notice they ended up creating a new uh, C-3PO R2 duo, a pair of um, droids. But they went into the corporate sector, which was the sort of little area they developed and then never came back to and that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring them back for, for uh, the Scourge book is because they're sort of this m- corporate meritocracy operating in space. And that mostly provides both a good bad, a good bad guy as well as uh, a chance to play with and make fun of, you know, organized organi- organizations. You know, they, they'll only pursue for so long because that's what it says in the book. They're, they're definitely creatures of order. And, uh... Yeah, I, th- I think that's a good place to stop for Star Wars okay. right this second. We'll come back. Because I really, really want to talk about... Mm. You wrote one of my top... One of my favorite books of all time. And uh, it's one of your books for Wizards of the Coast with Magic the Gathering, um, The Brothers' War, yes. which, of course, that story yes. starts there and then ends with Apocalypse yes. way, way, way <laughs> later, which I've read all... The Apocalypse is actually the last magic book I've read because that whole series just amazed me. And then, honestly, the rest of the Artifacts Cycle series wasn't as good as Brothers War. But Brothers War, I've even read a lot of the reviews, is considered one of the best magic books ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It, it is one of the – it's the first of the new magic books. They had a license, um, and I can't remember with who off the top of my head. And they had done uh, a series of books. Bill Fortune had written one, uh, written several. They had put cards in the book so people would, you know, basically be uh, – as a, as a bonus, and they thought, okay, this worked, but we'd like to actually publish in-house. So uh, I got the opportunity, based on you know uh, Cormier and other other stuff that I had written, uh, to write for uh, uh, write for Wizards and write the first of the big epic. They wanted a huge novel because Cormier had been a, a huge novel. They knew, okay, let's let's see if Jeff can write a huge novel on his own for this, and that was that was a lot of fun. The uh, the great thing about it. And I think one of the reasons that it worked was the set was already done by the time I approached and published and been out for a couple of years by the time I approached the work. So what I was doing was not as much keeping up with the design team as far as they're figuring out what all the cards do, what they're named, and what the major uh, story is, but I was approaching more as an archaeologist. I would go in and find all the card text and, and see, here's a reference to, you know, uh, Mishra, Mishra's Ankh. What does that mean? How does that fit into the world? Urza's uh, mitre. You know, what, it looks like a big cardinal hat. What, 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 what's going on there? What, why, why would he want a cardinal hat? Why was that important? And it, we sort of evolved the story and became a very much an attempt to put as many Easter eggs and things that, you know, a fan uh, who remembered those, those just to say, oh, I recognize that. I know what he's talking about. Um, so that was a great, you know, opportunity to tell a story. And again, writers pull from personal experience 
experience. Uh, I am the older brother uh, of, of my, my brother and I. I've got two siblings, a younger brother, a younger sister. My brother and I were similar age. And so we always, you know, one would choose A, the other would choose B. You know, we'd always go to, to go with, you know, completely different, try to go completely different directions. And so the idea of Urza as being the more scholarly, knowledgeable, uh, industrial brother, and Mishra as the more social, approachable, innovative brother is something that really took uh, flesh out of personal experience. My own brother's review of the book was, it's really good, but the wrong brother won. So, <laughs> uh, so that fell into it. Uh, the other thing was uh, Ashnod was – Originally, which is which, Ashnod uh, herself was named after uh, a in-house, well, an early fan uh, named Dave Howell, whose nickname was Snark online. So you took the first three, two letters of Dave uh, Howell Snark, and you scrambled together. You end up with Ashnod, and that's the origin of Ashnod's name. But it was a male character, and I had four primarily male characters, and I just it just felt yeah. So we, it's when when Ashnod became female, and this happens in a lot of my books, by the way, uh, a character suddenly flips gender, uh, and it changes the relationships because now suddenly uh, we can have a romance between Thanos and Ashnod. We can have the two, you know, having more not be as uh, as as, as hateful of each other as Urza and Mishra. Basically, they're the second level down that's still talking to each other to some degree and in places still see seeking peace. So we had, you know, Thomas the Boy Scout, Nashnot, who was, who was, you know, wild and crazy. And together, that made the, the characters, those characters in that relationship a lot more fun. But you know, as I said, it's off, often characters will, will flip gender uh, just as... Um, uh, just as, as and that's a running gag because a lot happens a lot of my work because it changes pe how characters interact with each other. It's, it's interesting how you mentioned how you were looking for Easter eggs because I remember after I read that book I went back through my cards yeah. and looked for Easter eggs and there were so many of them. I, 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 I liked reading the cards and finding the stories. Right. And then like with Tempest and so on and then I'd read the book and like oh that's the complete story this is so cool and the cards get me excited. It's not as much anymore. With the, the current sets where they kind of have like mini stories, yes. but uh, I, back in the day, I, I just, like Urza and Misha, I wanted to know that story so badly, and then I read the book, and it, it fascinated me. And I read that book several times, and then the book got lost, and I bought it on Kindle again recently because I realized I needed that book yeah, again. Yeah, he, he he got a little uh, crazy about that. I, I remember reading <laughs> that too. I was like, I was sitting there. I remember, I remember that for me, it was almost the opposite way, because one of the first books that I ever read for Magic. Uh, it was a friend of mine we were hanging out and he had like a bunch of books because he's always been into it and he just had it kind of sitting there and I picked it up looking at it I go what the heck is this dude and he goes oh it's uh, Magic the Gathering I go wait a second isn't that a card game and he goes well yeah but they write books for it too and I'm like oh, alright what the heck I'll give it a try Brothers War what's this all about the next thing I know I'm just buying this stuff like crack cocaine <laughs> I'm like, give me the cards, man. Give me the cards. It, it's, a, it's a great sign that the world is, and the concepts are very accessible. And oh, yeah. Magic, oh, yeah. Magic had an interesting approach because they wanted to do different things, so they ended up, like, shifting universes every three, uh, every three, uh, um... Every block. Yeah, every, yeah, every, block. every, every three card sets, yeah. Yeah, it was it was crazy for me because I've I been mean, like I remember that the dark uh, Ice Age. I love Ice Age, the by the way. Yeah. I know you did. I know you did, and I was like, oh my god, these are so cool. And those the dark was not connected with the other two Ice Age books. We sort of linked them together because we would do a set, we do a set, and we do a set, and sort of like dark was there, and then Ice Age was the one of the things where you basically they were doing new decks for, and then they did uh, uh, alliances after that, and that was sort of like so that became a de facto trilogy without intending to be so. Yeah, and what also is cool, and I actually have this buried somewhere right now, was the uh, the, the 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 little short story for Cold Snap that I got in one of the fat packs. Yes. I still have that somewhere. I don't know where I put it, but I have that. I thought it was amazing. 
Doing, doing short stories in a, in a shared world is a lot of fun because you can take one thing or one concept and you can play with it and you can expand out with it. And we did short stories for Forgotten Realms, for Dragonlance, for Magic, and it was a great way of both exp exploring the world as well as breaking new talent. Of bringing, you don't want to you know sign someone who's never done a book before uh, on, on on a hunch, but if you see they write short stories, you can basically you know work their way up to doing a full novel. So I have a question. Since you wrote early magic books, um, so they have writers that write the stories for the sets, and then they have then they tell the writers for the books what to write, or how does this work Oof. as far as the early stuff goes? There have there, there been, there been several attempts, several different versions uh, for the uh, uh, for um, the Brothers War and the Ice Age trilogy. It was very, for my case, these were sets that were already done, so it wasn't necessarily as much as um, um, uh, a situation for that as far as having the world builders, which were people like uh, Deneen McDermott, Will McDermott, her husband, Scott McGough, who, by the way, mm. works here at ArenaNet now um, mm. as one of our one of our world builders, is uh, they are well, – there was there, but at the time I was doing that, they were gathering things together and organizing and putting things together in such a fashion that they could really, you know, easily do it. What they are doing now, what they have done did – oh, Ten years later, was they would basically have the concept, have the idea, build the world, and this was a challenge for writers because often they would, uh, you know, start developing the cards, and they may come up with an idea or a concept or a mechanic that's really good, but then you read the novel. And it's no mention of it whatsoever. I remember when we had the avatars, the Avatar of War, etc., as, as major cards. Yet the novel didn't have that because, of course, the novel was written and had to be complete before the game was done in full development. So they, that's been a challenge that they've had to wrestle with. Interesting. So you, most of your work is in shared universes. Yes. Um, you've worked with uh, Blizzard a few times with, World of, with uh, Warcraft novels. Uh -huh. You've written in the StarCraft series, which... Just, I'm just going over some of these books because they're on my shelf. <laughs> you know, you've written one, um, Gabriel Mesta, which is Kevin Anderson. Which I, uh, Tracy Hickman's right. written, Gold, Christy Golden's written. Mm -hmm. This series has attracted a lot of really big authors, um, mm. and uh, apparently you, you didn't know that Gabriel Mesta was I, Kevin Anderson? I did not know. I did well, not know. Well, now you know. We found that out, actually, from him, and because uh, it's, it's, it's a mix of his, la his, uh, his wife's name um, as well. Okay. Um, her Rachel Moesta. I was going to say, what well, well, was it? Was it a team up? Did they work on it together? Um, or... No, he he just thought he'd want to write with a pen name, and then decided he didn't want to write any more pen names after that book. That sounds about right. That's a, that's a, I, I've considered that as well. I have never done so. Um, but I, you know, it, writing with a pen name has an advantage if you want to change gears. Now, often, and or if you have a name that has uh, starts with a W, like Dave Wolverton told us why he writes as David Farland because his his name is too far down on the bottom of the shelves, and so he had to move it back up. Um, I've I've heard that uh, um, uh, comparison being Dean Koontz does well because he's near Stephen King, you know. As far as the horror <laughs> writing is concerned, they own the K's between the two of them. I knew uh, somebody was going to bring that up eventually. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the but yeah, the um, uh, the opportunity. I mean, to basically go off and do some, do shared world books, and this was with Pocket, uh, is you know really great. But for that one, I was much more on the uh, this is the assignment, this is where we're going, as opposed to uh, overseeing the line itself and, and knowing where all the bodies. So it was literally getting the project done and being aware of the existence of other writers, but not as much of the communication part. A lot of – now, coming out of TSR, we had a lot of writers uh, who came out of that area, and a group of us had formed our own writer, writing group known as the Illiterates. Rob King, who wrote another Magic the Gathering book, um, the Thran, uh, basically put together and we share how it came from this shared experience of all having written novels for um uh, tsr so it's sort of like that's sort of like our area that we come out of uh troy denning was a member for example we're talking about star wars novels 
Uh, Lester Smith, who now does a lot of poetry in Wisconsin. Uh, Steve Sullivan. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss more, more than more than a few. Stephen Shen. Um, good, good, you know, people that we basically been all pulling together, and we still are the the West Coast gang. Still meets on a monthly basis where we get together, drink beer, and complain about editors. So. <laughs> So that's where we come out of. So by the same token, that's our little nest. So I have never – I don't think I've – I think I've met Kevin J. Anderson a couple times, but we've never really sat down and talked. So with all these shared universe novels, um, we know, you know your connection with Matt Novels and, and Dragonland. So with Mass the Gathering, with Warcraft, with Starcraft, were you fans of these series before you started working on them? Or did you play through the games? Were you familiar with the franchise uh, when you started working? Um with Magic the Gathering, yes, I was a big fan. Had played pl- played these, you know, these games. You know, basically, I was part of the Jim at uh, uh, TSR. Jim Ward was the one who brought it in house. Who brought? Who came back with the first decks and taught everybody how to play. He was the designer of Gamma World, among many other things. Um, and I, early on, I traded, I believe, a set of the, of the early Forgotten Realms. I sent it to Peter Atkinson, who I had uh, uh, met at conventions, and we had chatted about other projects, and he sent me like 10 decks, 10 alpha decks, which I took to a, a weekend gaming convention with friends and gave away. We all met at somebody's house. I said, here, I've got a new game, and... It went crazy. Everybody loved it, and you know, uh, everybody. But and everybody got alpha cards. You know, who knew at that time? We had no idea that alphas were going to be so collectible. Oh, oh, oh man, <laughs> I, I as a nerd, just heard, <laughs> I had ten alpha decks. I gave them away. <laughs> I gave them I'm away. Just, I'm just sitting there thinking. I'm so glad this is over an audio connection. <laughs> Oh my God, that's awesome! That's I, I, I think cool. I think one of the gangs got one of the gangs got a mox, and he like oh. like six months later for Christmas he sold it and bought Christmas presents for and used it to the money to buy Christmas presents for his family. So that was that, that was very nice. Yeah, it's it's like one of my friends who's just like the other day he's like yeah I just lost ten modern masters packs in my room somewhere. Yeah, and so my wife my, my wife probably threw them away. It's like ten modern masters packs. They're like twenty dollars each minimum. Mm-hmm. And it's just—it's okay to lose them. Why? <laughs> <laughs> so the Warcraft—I was a fan of the original Warcraft uh, games, the first two uh, M2. that I played, and you, they basically so the opportunity to write for it make, was very exciting and gave me the opportunity to, to talk with them. This was before it was World of Warcraft. It was, was just a Warcraft book, and you know I look at it sometimes and okay they've moved some things around, but you play the various Warcraft games and you notice that they've changed the map dramatically as they go from game to game. Such that you know the wait a minute, that's the city of Dalaran was someplace completely different when we were here the last time. So they they, they keep evolving. Hmm? I'm like, what's going on? I remember that. I remember that. And that's because they have, so they're compre- com- they're working from a computer game basis, and each new computer game is a chance to revisit and rethink the ideas according to what the needs of that computer game is. Now, StarCraft, I had played, but not extensively. So that one was one where I had to do a lot of research along the lines of playing through the, through the storyline. Um, in particular, we talked about various different ideas and finally settled, since this was going to be the first of the StarCraft books, uh, on an adaptation of the first first third of the, uh, the the human story, effectively, on StarCraft. Yeah. And threaded through that was uh, Michael Liberty, a newsman. He was my creation. Uh, his first name was – he was Danny Liberty in the first draft. And, you know, I was just having the hardest time with him until I decided he was Mike Royko from the Chicago uh, Tribune and, and later the Sun-Times, who I had, whose column I had read, you know, extensively uh, back in the day. And when he became Mike – Suddenly, everything fell into place, and it was just smooth going and a, and a, and a great opportunity to thread this story of this guy. Because most of the communications that are occurring in the game, we've got the cinematics, but most of the communications are just little headshots and little 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 comments back and forth. And basically, th- that's driving the plot as we go forward in the story. So you can basically, using that material, then expanding it out into a full 
novel. Now, what's interesting is years later, I came to work here at uh, ArenaNet. I'm working for James Finney, who was our design lead at the time. And James was not only involved in StarCraft, he was responsible for that story. So James and I had teamed up like 10 years before either one of us was at, were at ArenaNet to write this, uh, uh, to basically do StarCraft. So I, I, one last thing about Magic and, and Warcraft and StarCraft. Uh, we know there's a Warcraft movie coming out soon. Uh -huh. We know they're working on a Magic the Gathering movie. Have you ever wondered or been curious if they're ever going to use any of your, you know, not, not that they have to ask you permission because, you know, they belong to Blizzard and Wizards, but that they're going to use any of your elements in those movies? Because I've heard it say that they want to make Urza and Mishra as part of the Magic the Gathering movie because that's a good place to start. Uh -huh. And Warcraft, you know, they have Medivh. They've already announced Ben Foster's Medivh and so on. So have you ever just been curious if they're going to use elements of your stories well, in those movies? First off, no one has called me. But and and I would be you know uh, delighted if I said oh they use that they basically picked that up and ran with it that would make me happy. Um, but by the same token, they're going to probably do what needs to be done to tell a good story. I think Urza and Mishra are a good core story, a good center for the Magic the Gathering universe. Everything ties back to them, so I think that's really a ex if they choose to do that as as the story. I think that's excellent. The, for the uh, Warcraft novel, somebody online in one of the forums said, you know, well they cast this person as Medivh. Obviously, they must be using the Last Guardian as a model. I wonder if they brought in Jeff Grubb. And my my comment was. What the what what? <laughs> Isn't it even like the first three games? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was, and a lot of what happened in Warcraft was based on the unpublished game they had been working on. They had a plot that they were working on for Medivh, and they did not. Uh, they, they never saw the light of day. So that was basically source material that I also folded in to the novel as well. You know, and they basically you know made made uh, the guys that. Uh, uh, Blizzard happy just from the fact that they had done the stuff and it's seen the light of day in continuity to some, to some degree. Before I move on to ArenaNet, because there's definitely a lot to talk about that because I have lots of friends, are huge, huge fans of work there. Uh, James has a question which he's been dying to ask for a bit. Sure. Well, not so much dying, but it's just a sheer... No, you've been dying. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, no, I just I wanted to, to touch, if I may, a little bit on your work with D20 Modern. Okay. Um, cause I mean, I, I, a lot of people that I've played with just, you know, friends of mine and things of that nature, some are big fans of the D20 system. Others are like, oh my God, look, Satan made a thing. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I'm kind of in the middle, you know, I mean, I don't mind it, but you know, either or, uh, to me, I don't care. You know, a good mechanic's a good mechanic, a good gameplay system works. But, like, I just, like, what was it like delving into that, like, with, the, with D20 Modern? Like, what was the experience there? D20 Modern, working with Bill Slavisek was wonderful. I, you know, Bill's a friend, and we've been, you know, working together for many years on different projects. The idea of D20 Modern, it was the challenge for the core books was to make it, you know, be a flexible enough system that we could do uh, military adventures and Wild West adventures and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and any type of modern uh, uh, life that popped up, and that's where we came up with the concept. Uh, this is one when I actually pitched the original idea of, as opposed to having the fighter, the rogue, the magic user, we had the strong hero, the tough hero, the charismatic hero, and we basically use that as a basis. You build up, and then you start moving off into various professions and jobs. And it actually, you know, worked very, very well. Uh, we had a regular Thursday night um, uh -huh. uh, game session over at Bill's where we would be testing mechanics, and uh, I ended up with, uh, uh, my character was uh, Moondog Greenberg, who was a uh, tough uh, Talmudic scholar on a motorcycle. He was a hell's angel with the tree of life on the back, it was stitched in, gold, in silver studs on the back of his jacket. Uh, so it, it, this was just like great opportunity that allowed us to, you know, go and check with, you know, this modern investigator. We could do horror, we could do adventure. I think that the core concept really worked out. Now we had, had the opportunity of doing, from as a result, uh, uh, D20 Past, D20 Future. They did the whole uh, someone the wolf was involved with um, the uh, uh, paranormal. 
uh, modern day one. It, just like we had a lot of cool stuff that basically could come out of this because while well, fantasy, there's a traditional fantasy trope um, uh-huh, that uh-huh. basically you, you, you say fantasy and you get – Tolkien, or you get D anD D, or you get World of Warcraft in mind, and you and you are working from a base. Modern adventure has a lot more challenges to it because it's got so many different subgroups. And as soon as you decide I'm going to do a uh, police procedural, okay, now you're pushing everything else aside, and that makes it much more of a challenge to do adventures and uh, stories for a lot of people. Does that, does that address, address your question? Or is there no, a, it, it, it does, but that kind of like leads me a little bit, if I may, into Urban Arcana. Yes. Because like that, to me, seemed like it was kind of a mix of both. Mm-hmm. Like you had that high fantasy thing almost, but at you know with the dragons, bugbears, all that. But you know, but the whole concept that humans just can't even comprehend that, and to them, the world is just normal world. I mean, like. It, that to me, I thought was an awesome kind of uh, reality, melody. reality yeah. shared delusion. Yes. Yeah, not, not necessarily the same as what uh, Vampire does with its uh, Masquerade. Mm-hmm. It's uh, I think one of their other other game systems is like a veil. Basically, you don't want to you know show off that you know, the world. You can't break the break the rule by uh, using magic publicly. Some reason for it, but the idea that humanity itself tends to knit over and say, okay, that wasn't a fireball. That wasn't a gas main explosion. That wasn't wasn't a uh, uh, a bugbear. It was a tough guy. Uh, you know, basically, we all rewrite our uh, the mem- memories. Which which is actually one of the reasons eyewitness accounts often vary is people are seeing something and interpreting very differently. But uh, that we just played with that and brought that large on the scale on a larger scale when we did Urban Arcana, and we saw the roots there in you know in the D20 Modern. But we wanted to be able to utilize it. Plus, Urban Arcana allowed us to use any D20 D and D monster we so so chose. We could just port it over there and, and basically bring it over and play games with it there. Yeah, that's what I that's what I kind of thought about it too. Like I'm like, wow, you could just about drop anything in this. Yeah. <laughs> you want guns in D and D? You just bring the D and D to the guns. So yeah, mm-hmm. just, let's go. Let's have it. Just give me some guns, a flamethrower. Um, I'm riding on a dragon, and I can make lightning come out of my mouth. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. <laughs> you well, know, that's what I thought was cool about it. One concept I had back at TSR, and this D20 uh, Urban Arcana was uh, um, as close as we, we got to it, was um, I referred to it as Arcana Punk, which was cyberpunk with magic. And mm-hmm. that was the, wiz- the wizard on the Harley. And I just talked about Moondog Greenberg, and he was my wizard on a Harley that I basically played with. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like that quite a bit personally. <laughs> Well, that so that, that, that does answer my question about the <laughs> okay. D20 stuff. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So we're gonna move. We're gonna move to ArenaNet. ArenaNet, of course, is makes the Guild Wars. It's founded by lots of former Blizzard employees. Um, how did you first get involved? I believe you got involved for Nightfall. Yes, was the first one. Uh, how, how did you first get involved? Was it because of your connection with Blizzard with those novels before, or how did they no, find you? No. And then what was your role exactly with those games? Actually, actually it was uh, ArenaNet was founded by uh, three former members of uh, Blizzard, uh, Jeff, Mo, and Pat, and they basically. Uh, moved up here to the Seattle area. They were doing a uh, arena net was originally conceived as being a different type of. Uh, they didn't even call it an MMO uh, of, of a uh, uh, massive player game. It was wasn't really that RPG type. They were looking like where you build your deck it was much more magic influenced, where you built your character and he had certain skills and you would fight against each other. And that was the original concept and it evolved into the full Guild Wars that we have. Now, at the time, one of the guys doing the story was a former Wizards of the Coast editor named Jess LeBeau. And Jess is a good guy. And uh, he and I worked together on the uh, um, um, uh, Ice Age novels. He was my editor on those. And even so, we would get together and play Magic the Gathering, 
at various pizza places. I was working for WizKids at the time, and we uh, would get together at a local sushi place, and one time he said, I'd like to bring a friend. And I said, sure. Um, somebody, he, said, he said, somebody I'm working with. He was working at ArenaNet at the time. He brought Jeff Strain, one of the original pa- partners. And we sat down, and we talked about game design and, and what he was doing with uh, uh, like water levels in the original Guild Wars. And we, we had a great time. And as a result of that, I came and I interviewed at ArenaNet, and I blew it entirely. <laughs> I had a, I mean, I had a good enough interview. We interviewed, you know, talked to the group, took the tour, talked to the artists, you know, basically. And they sat me down across from Mike O'Brien, one of the other partners, and he sort of said, "So, what have you been playing?" And I said, "Well, I play a lot of D and D and Call of Cthulhu, and you know, basically, you know, a lot of board games." I'm sorry, sorry. What computer games are you playing? Oh, well, I play a lot of Civilization, like Tropico Line. He goes, no, 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 no. What MMOs are you playing? And I said, well, I'll be honest with you. I don't play a lot of MMOs because I'm involved in a lot of other stuff. He goes, okay, well. And at that point, the conversation went south, and I didn't get the job. But they didn't forget me. So a couple years later, when they were looking for somebody mm. who would work both as a designer and a writer in a world-building capacity, they called me back. And in the, in the meantime, I started playing MMOs. And, you know, I took the tour and I met the artists and we talked about various things. We looked at art and everything. And they sat me down across from Mo and, and uh, he said, so what have you been playing? Oh, I've been playing City of Heroes and World of Warcraft. Let me tell you about my, uh, my uh, Torin Hunter that I've got uh, up, up to 35th level. And, and, you know, at that point, okay, he saw that I basically – I had done the homework. I had basically come out of the first failed interview. I said, okay, if I'm going to do things in the MMO community, I'm really going to have to learn the lingo. And I became part, and I basically embraced it and studied for many, for a couple of years, literally. Play, you know, my wife's saying, what are you doing? Working, honey. I'm, you know, researching, playing City of Heroes. And well, if you didn't say, like, what do you play? RuneScape? And yeah. Just RuneScape? Yeah. Just RuneScape? <laughs> but, and if you're interested City of Heroes! And if you're interviewing with, you know, for RuneScape, you're you're there. <laughs> but uh, that was that was actually how I how I got the job. And I, I tell that story. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. Because our company doesn't forget, you know, good talent. We will come back. We've had a couple people who have told me that story and return. I've told that story to here, and they said, "Yeah, that happened to me too. I, I, I had an interview and it didn't work well. And then a couple of years passed, and they interviewed me again. So." And have you continued to work uh, with them ever since? Ever since I, I, just, I think I just passed eight years with them. We, I came in on the last two weeks of uh, factions, where I was just checking the language and names to make sure it wasn't anything particularly rude for all the names. And um, we started in on Nightfall as being the uh, the next big thing, and we were going to you know turn that around in six months, and so it was a very aggressive schedule. Uh, Eye of the North, and then we so we went dark for. Many years. We, we had told people, like, when Eye of the North came out, we're working on Guild Wars 2, and then we just went quiet. And we started telling people what we were doing and how we were developing it. And at the time, the things we had, we had the story, which I helped develop, and some beautiful, beautiful art that our artists, inclu- led by Daniel Dossier, who uh, uh, had created. So Daniel and I were among the team that went to, like, uh, Cologne, games, uh, the big games fair out there, Gamescom. And we spent like, I think, three days uh, solid in a very small room telling people about the story of races coming together to fight a greater foe and the artisanal handcrafted look of our, um, uh, of our, uh, of our world. And we had done it so many times that by the third day, Daniel and I started swapping uh, roles. I started talking about the art and he started talking about the story <laughs> just because we had learned <laughs> each other's lines so well. But it was it was a great opportunity, and I, I really appreciate it. And you know, since then the game has been very very successful. We're really happy with both. You know, it's a, uh, a buy to play. You know, you buy the game, and then you know, 
you play the game. And most people that we do microtransactions, and those are uh, for you know mini pets and outfits and uh, various. As long tools. as it's not pay to win, it's like not, it's the pay, uh, it's, Silk Road was, which is pay so you can get on the server within an hour. It's it's particularly not pay to win. That that that's just it's what we say it's buy to play, and so it's an equality of condition, and you're not going to be able to uh, make your buy buy the best armor. Just because you have, you know, a, a lot of uh, free spending, you get some cool-looking stuff, uh, and that's where we're comfortable with it. We're all gamers by heart ourselves, so we want to play the game, but design the game we want to play. And I'm still playing it. I taught my wife how to play it. I lost my account to her because she created a character. Now she plays it so well. I had to get a second account for myself. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm catching up with her. She's had two characters at level 80 already, and is close on a third right now. Just to make sure, your role is you write the stories. Um, how long does it take to write, to, for example, Guild Wars 2, how long did it take to write the core story before they could just start really, like, working on things? Uh, oh, no, the baby's crying. Do you want to try that again? Without, well, without the baby? Okay. Or, well, you, you, write the, you write the stories for Guild Wars. Um, how long did it take to write, say, the core story for... I don't think it's going to get much quieter. Okay, that's... Guild Wars 2, um, before they could start really working on... Uh, the actual like gameplay and so on. Um, the story evolved over time. Uh, literally, we, we we talked about we we set up some basic concepts of what we wanted to do, and then we continually came back and iterated and changed and evolved. And one of the big things, you know, it's not such a thing as the writer label labors and he presents this, you know, wonderfully coherent clockwork universe that nothing can change. Because if you desire just that, it will end in tears because everybody <laughs> wants to throw their ideas. And instead, we created here are our major po points. Here is our theme. Here's our core ethos, if you will. We have five different – we decided early on we wanted to use five races and bring them together, you know, basically to face a whole uh, common foe. This became this idea of unity, and it works well for an MMO of putting a group together. A lot of our mechanics are of the type as a result that when you see another player, it's not because, you know, you don't say, oh, great, he's going to steal my kills, or he's, he's going to grief me, or he's going to do something stupid. We make it so easy easy for players to work together, that it basically that becomes part of the common theme of the world. And I think that's one reason is it's a popular world. People like to be able to get, and they are not in direct competition. They're not fighting for that critical drop. They are all getting a, getting a potential to, you know, to basically contribute. And the monsters scale up as well. More people show up, the monsters get tougher. You retain a, t a challenge to it. Uh, all of this, you know, basically comes back and it works well with the story. When we got the core story together, we have a number of different zones and areas that we have been developing. And for each zone, we approach, what's the story of the zone? Who's the main combatants here? What kind of creatures are you fighting? What are the main characters involved in here? And basically, we started building these loops of what we call dynamic events, where base, uh, uh, you have centaurs raiding. So you don't just you know go out and see a whole bunch of centaurs standing out in the field. The centaurs actually come, and they raid the town, and if you don't defend the town, they burn the town to the ground, and then you have to drive out the centaurs, then you have to rebuild the town, and then you have to go at late launch a raid against the centaurs. So you end up creating these uh, the step, step, step of uh, different adventures, so it's never quite the same area when you come into it twice. So that becomes a part of it. Um, in addition, myself, now at this point, um, it's both myself and a young lady named Reese Sosby, who's another published author. She's done uh, stuff in um, uh, Legends of the Five Rings and also some uh, Dragonlance uh, juvenile novels more recently. And, she, and she's been involved with the current uh, live-action uh, vampire games that they that just saw republication. Anyway, she's she and I base, uh, basically were at that time also writing cinematics and stories and basically larger uh, larger uh, themes that basically strung through a whole bunch of different adventures of who the your uh, iconic characters were, who were the heroes of this world, what were their faults, how did they they evolve. Plus, we ended up overseeing a lot of the initial uh, voiceover recording, which means we not only, you know, we wrote a lot of lines, we have other writers who are writing a whole bunch of dialogue. We're checking to make sure it all fits together. We're going down, and I think at one point we spent 
oh gosh, like six weeks total at three different studios for, uh, for, for the voice recording. And we got some wonderful, wonderful talent. Um, uh, Fred Tattershore, uh, and I'm just drawing a blank right now. I'm sorry. I apologize. You got the Hulk. Right I apologize. There. Fred Tattershore is the Hulk. So. Fred Tattershore yeah. is the Hulk. I, I do believe there. I do believe there is a shrine up in the Hollywood Hills where voice actors go to of of, of Fred Tattershore, where people come to you know leave uh, uh, offerings for uh, for success. <laughs> but we've had Nolan North. We have. Uh, um, <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, we, we had we had we had wonderful uh, voice talent down there. We spent a uh, a long time doing, and we would send down people in shifts, you know. <laughs> and so we, so we ended up training a lot of people how to handle voiceover. And this was compared to what we had for Nightfall, where we had maybe. 500 lines because we never would VO anything except for the, the the dialogues, the scenes. So you know, so that was very much a much simpler operation than what we did when we moved into a full MMO space. And uh, one, one interesting thing is we've actually interviewed a lot of the voice cast, uh, cast of Guild Wars too. We've had really? Jennifer Hill on. We've had Gideon Emery on. Tom Kane, who's the narrator, we've had him on. Um, Oh, the, the baby's going out. I apologize. Oh, we're going to be in black. Oh, my. That's fine. That's we, you know, and, and we'd love to have, like, Tara Strong and stuff. I'm like, you, that game's had an amazing cast. So. We've been very, we've been very fortunate, and what we've been doing has been involved in the past too. So we would basically send out uh, signs, descriptions of who this character is, and asking for you know, auditions. And we spend days just going for auditions. Okay, so, um, can you still hear me? I can still can you hear you. Yeah. Okay, I, I, so, um, I'm going to pick up Bruce for a second. James, can you ask for asking yes. your questions? I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. Oh, poor child. Oh, Master Bruce is upset. Oh, poor kid. Okay, that's oh, cool with goodness. <laughs> I know. No, he's just, he, he gets that way. We, we... We like Master Bruce. Master Bruce apparently uh, he he skews well with the audience. Apparently, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you love him. I, I think he's I'm sure he's much cuter when basically he's gurbling and he's trying to eat the mic. So <laughs> yes, but no, they like the, they like the attack too. They're like, oh, Master Bruce is upset. <laughs> but a anyway, I, I have a few friends that listen to the show, mm -hmm. and from what you've said. And mention that you played, they would probably kill me if I did not ask this. Okay. Now, uh, you, you mentioned you played City of Heroes. Yes. One wonders what server you played on. Gosh. Mm. If you remember it all. I'm going to say Paragon. My character was Dr. Samir. My main was Dr. Samir. And we also, we also, if you can't remember that, we would be settled for character names. Because well, okay. we were huge well, game. And, uh, okay, you're you're cutting in and out here. I do apologize. My oh, internet went a right. little tarted. Okay. I live in Florida. Lightning's lightning's just normal. <laughs> Understood. Up up in uh, we're up in Seattle. If we have like uh, there's this one peal of thunder, you know, it rolls through the entire valley, and everyone talks about it the next day. Ah, uh, I believe. Let's not vigilance. I'm looking things up here. Let's <laughs> not triumph. Wouldn't it have happened to have been virtue, would it? I think it was virtue. I think it was virtue. My main was a, a, a healer, Dr. Samaritan, defender, uh, who was in green with the big green cross across the front of him. His, his thing was healing people at random. Uh, I had a character named the Crimson Moonbat who uh, did not see a lot of play. But I would get online, and I'd have a lot of friends who were in the Midwest. So they would have you know, gotten started by the time I got home. Um, but they were a, mm. a, a nice bunch. You know, um, Miranda Horn. Uh, I, I, have, hmm? I have actually heard of Dr. Samaritan. I will not lie. Really? To what degree? Yes. Uh, well, I used to play with a bunch of my friends. We were on the East Coast, but we didn't care. Uh, we were we played on Virtue. We were yeah. up all the time. We played it constantly. 
We remember pretty much everybody. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but, I, yeah I, I actually... Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm very surprised because, you know, he, he was... He was he was moving along. I, I really enjoyed playing the character, but I would get involved in these huge fights, you know, where you get, like, everybody involved, dog piling on. I refer to those as fighting the rainbow because you get in the middle of it. You couldn't mm-hmm. see anything because there was just so many effects going off all at once. The best you could do was yes. attack and just hope you got a bad guy. Of doom. <laughs> yes. Well, there's, there's a group who's trying to put the, yeah, together. like, oh, God, I hope it hits. I hope it hits. I hope it hits. Huh. Okay, I got experience. Must have oh, worked. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. But yeah, I'll, did I, that ask, I, did I, ask for you, Mr. James? Yeah. Um, oh no, absolutely. I, so do you? Yes, did, I, remember, I, I, uh, I have to. I have to I'm ask very something. happy, and I'm hoping that my friends who listen will be pleased. Now, <laughs> was Lady Gumdrop oh, on your server as well? Yes. Okay. That's Miranda Horner. I She's remember the, the name. The yep, Lady Gumdrop. So. She's working for Steve Jackson Whoa. Games. Mm-hmm. Wow. She was See, a watch the You editor. never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to meet when it comes to City of Heroes. I've always said yeah. that. That was a great game. It was, it was a sad, sad day when the servers died. But I, yeah. I am aware of the people that are trying to sort of bring it back. A lot of us are like, yes, Kickstarter, please fund this. <laughs> I wish them the best of luck. I think they've got a lot. Of, it, it's having gone through a five, six year process for a triple A MMO uh, with uh, ArenaNet it is a big, big challenge. Um, it is, you know, uh, I was talking with a group down at the Art Institute of Portland. And there's a lot of things. They say, what do you, oh, we want to make an MMO, and I and I just say, yeah, that's a bit that's a bit hard. That, that you 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 just can't set up three guys and build a full fledged MMO. You look back at the original Guild Wars against what's being what's going on now, and you see the investment. Uh, everything is there. The depth, the realism is wonderful. But by the same token, you've got um, all this effort that has to go in to you know get the little bunny hopping in the background on the screen. So, um, my son has dictated that we need to wrap this. Okay, sounds like a joke. And I believe James is kids, and I need to wrap this. So, um, thank you for being on, sir. This has been fantastic. We could have gone for, for hours talking about all this stuff, because you basically worked on yes. all my favorite franchises. I worked on everything, um, and, and we can we can pick it up again if you want. <sighs> we, we'd we love to do that. And your your wife is uh, um, Karen Novak, isn't it? Uh, Kate. Or, Kate Novak. Yeah, she wrote in the Forgotten Realms she, with you as well. She was the my uh, co-writer on the first books we wrote together. Uh, when we did uh, uh, Azure Bonds, I was telling her what the plot was on a trip to Milwaukee, and by the time I got there, I had a co-writer, and one of the characters had changed gender. Uh, Olive Ruskettle was originally Oliver Ruskettle. So the uh, so yes, and she's you know we're there. She writes once in a blue moon. She does a lot more stuff with tax preparation now. Well, um, what we'd like to do at the very end, we'd like to ask all our, our guests, you, you have the, the soapbox to promote whatever you'd like to promote. Do you have any upcoming appearances, any upcoming novels? Um, you can promote Guild Wars 2, since I will pro- someone might not be playing it by now. I, I, I will promote the heck out of Guild Wars 2, because I think that is a wonderful game. It's a great opportunity. It's a very accessible game. It's got a very nice community of, of people who are all playing it. And it's one of those games in which you can, you can play it, and you don't, have to, you don't have to play a subscription. You don't have to pay additional fees. Come in and enjoy it. We build a beautiful world there. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you, sir. This has been fantastic. Uh, well, we'll ask our listeners to see if we can get enough questions to have you on again because uh, you have so, you've worked on so much we could barely scratch the surface okay, okay. of what you've done today. Um, just based on your games you've worked on alone, uh, the the tabletop games. So uh, we'll definitely have you on again. Thank you so much for this. Um, where can people find you if they want to contact you directly or see your site and so on? I have a personal website, uh, grubstreet.blogspot.com, uh, which is uh, where I talk about many things, most of which don't have anything to do with gaming whatsoever. You know, things like collectible quarters and plays that I've seen recently. So uh, be warned, but, and I can be reached by uh, my address at, at that site. As I found out, it's an, it was actually you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. Actually, you probably won't be surprised, but I, I try contacting people a lot, and usually the address goes to, like, either a fan club member 
or sometimes their agent, if you're lucky, but like usually goes to like a random fan club and be like, we don't actually work for this person. We just run their website. I, I'm not. I'm not at that stage yet. I mean, my my day job is building worlds uh, for you know for large corporations. So. Therefore, I'm, I'm a little more uh, small, small core when it comes to uh, 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 running my website. Mm -hmm. Just be careful if you start working for Umbrella Corporation, your life expectancy is not very long. So I hear. No. <laughs> yes. Sure. In fact, if you started working for them today, you'd be dead three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I'll just restart. <laughs> oh! Anything else to add at the end, James? <laughs> Anything to add at the end, James? No, I am thoroughly happy. I got to ask my little fan question, which is completely unpredicted, and I'm <laughs> happy about that. That was so cool to me. <laughs> well, so, so, I, 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 I was just going to say, I just wanted to say thank you. This was awesome. Well, thank you both. It was a pleasure being here. <laughs>